for the uh, Planning Commission Subdivision Committee uh, for the City of Los Alamitos. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Chair DeBolt. Present. Vice Chair Riley. Absent. <laughs> Commissioner Andre. Absent. Commissioner Quilty. Here. Commissioner Groves. Here. Commissioner Lowe. Here. And Commissioner Sulfulcanic. Here. Okay. If you'd rise for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. <coughs> At this time, we'll... Uh, open the meeting for uh, oral communications. If there's anyone in the audience that would like to address the Planning Commission on uh, any item that's within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Commission uh, that's not on the agenda, you can come up and speak right now. If you're interested in something that's on the agenda, you can wait until then and we'll have uh, be able to speak at that time. Seeing none, I'll close that. Move to approval of the minutes. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Any second? Second. Okay. All in, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I abstain. Abstain. Okay. Yeah, so it passes. Uh, we'll move on to. Um, we have no discussion items. No consent calendar. Uh, move to item 9, which is a uh, public hearing uh, consideration of a site plan review for the Catella Deli addition and renovation. Can we have a staff report, please? Uh, Chair DeBolt and members of the Planning Commission, site plan review. No, oh, let me turn on. Site plan review 1805 is a consideration of an expansion and reface of a restaurant at 4470 Catella Avenue, which is Catella Deli, um, on a 1.3 acre parcel in the commercial office um, district. And the applicant is here with us tonight, David Abbas of DMA Builders, and also Craig Oka, who is the architect on the project. And. Uh, Mr. Abbas has submitted a site plan review application for the expansion and reface of the, the restaurant on behalf of the restaurant owner who is Bagel Boys LLC. The application requests approval for a 1,758 square foot addition to the existing 16,602 square foot building. And it's also including full renovation of the exterior of the building in a modern art deco kind of style and a reconfiguration of the parking area. The additional square feet will allow for a larger customer, uh, customer space in the bakery and ADA uh, upgrade of the bathrooms. Uh, the addition of the square feet requires a site plan review when it's a commercial building. Uh, and as shown in the table in your staff report, the development standards are met for the CO zone in this project. And in consideration of uh, parking for the property, Catella Deli is part of a, uh, an agreement to maintain reciprocal access and parking with the entire shopping area from there down to Subway, if you remember where that's at. And uh, as part of that, they have to maintain 103 spaces, but they're proposing 114, so this is more spaces. And the layout is a little bit different for the parking lot, so it'll be a lot easier to drive in and out of. Uh, and when the addition to the structure is less than 25%, then uh, you do whatever landscaping you can to increase if you can. Uh, this uh, is 11%, which is basically the same as what was there before. So, and uh, staff recommends that the commission open the public hearing and receive any comments that the public or the applicants 
representative may have and then recommends approval of the product project with the conditions listed in the draft resolution thank you thank you uh, this time do we have any questions from the Commission of the it's just 100, 112 correct not 114 parking spaces uh, we'll have to ask them when they come up here yeah Okay. Maybe I just misspoke or something. No, okay. okay, maybe. Any other questions? I got 12 somewhere. Okay, at this time I'll uh, open the public hearing, uh, invite the uh, applicant up if they'd like to tell us a little bit more about the project. Good evening, uh, Commissioner DeBow and members of the, uh, Chairman DeBow and members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Craig Oak, I'm the architect uh, for Catella Dally. Um, First off, I want to thank Mr. Oliver for doing an excellent job on this staff report. Um, you pretty much explained everything about the project, so I'll keep this brief. Uh, to get to the parking, um, we are proposing 12 additional stalls. Existing was 102, so the uh, proposed uh, is 114. So that should answer that. Um, like I said, I'll keep this brief. What, this, is, this project's obviously been an icon uh, of Los Alamitos for a long time, and we, it's about time they've, you know, they've been doing these piecemeal, piecemeal remodels interior, and they've had these plans to do this big you know, update to kind of uh, refurbish it, um, and also at the same time take care of some of the ADA issues that they have. So a big part of the project is expanding the front entry, making it more welcoming, uh, building acceptable restrooms per current code standards, and refacing the building to bring it more current into the times. Uh, Mr. Oliver um, summarized the parking uh, reconfiguration, and we did uh, want to simplify the parking traffic flow to minimize all the cross aisles and, and the intersections where people are walking to the restaurant and people are turning right and stuff. So we tried to simplify the traffic flow and provide a central median for uh, pedestrians to get to the restaurant without having to walk down the aisle. That's a big part of the project. The other part of the project is the restaurant's visited often by elderly people and they, the restaurant's currently raised and there are steps and or steep ramps to get in. And we wanted to eliminate that. so. In do, redoing the parking lot, it allowed us to raise the grades at the front entry to the parking drive, and that allowed us to get rid of the steps and make a much easier uh, transition. Um, I think uh, everything else was covered in Mr. Oliver's staff reports. So if you have any other questions, uh, I can either answer them or if there's any restaurant-related questions, we have uh, people from the restaurant here. So. Okay. Are there any questions of the applicant while he's up there? No. None? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this is a public hearing. If there's anyone in the audience wishing to uh, speak to this item, this is the time. You can come up and... Uh, all right, seeing none, I'll close the uh, public hearing. We'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, do we have any, uh, any discussion? Or would somebody like to make a motion? I kind of wondering are they going to tear the parking lot maybe all at once maybe that should have been asked of the applicant or is it going to be done in stages the transition for the parking lot since they probably will stay open during that time yeah we're going to do it in two phases well, why don't you come on up and you can uh, go ahead and respond to the question hi my name is david i'm the uh, construction manager for Catella deli and uh, we're going to do it in uh, the parking area in two phases okay, great okay any other questions i'll make a motion to approve it i'll second okay we have a motion to uh, approve the project and a second um all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None? Okay. Thank you. Motion passes? Okay. Great.
second chair. Uh, we'll move on to uh, item 9B. Just looking for one thing here. Um, before we have a staff report, I'd like to. Uh, I, I would like for uh, to bifurcate uh, the this agenda item uh, into uh, two parts. One, the uh, approval for the uh, uh, mitigated, you know, for the environmental mitigated uh, negative deck, and also the um, uh, remediation, the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. That's part of that. Uh, that has to be approved first according to our uh, staff report before we can move to the project. I'd like to deal with that first and then have the the project itself come up and have, we'll have that, that staff report. So that's I think how we'll do it. So if we could have uh, a, a staff report on the um, on the environmental. Okay. Uh. Well, this is a 107-unit residential apartment complex, and uh, California, the California Environmental Quality Act, which is CEQA, asks that uh, you do an initial study to find out what kind of CEQA report should be done for the project. And uh, it was prepared, and it was decided that it needed to be a mitigated negative declaration because the uh, applicant was willing to do whatever mitigation measures were required to to build the project. And uh, the mitigation measures are somewhat similar to the uh, project next door on the Olson project. Uh, and uh, the consultant firm who uh, took care of this is PlaceWorks. And uh, they, they also did the, the project next door for Olson as well. And uh, then uh, let's see what other parts are about that. Yeah, I think I'll leave it at there for that. Okay. I won't describe a lot of it in detail, so. All right. Yeah. Okay, uh, and within that report, uh, just uh, it covers the various areas of environmental, including hazardous waste, traffic. Correct. And the hazardous, the, the, um, anyway, um, so at this point, we'll, um, are there any questions of staff at this point? I'd like to. We'll have the applicant come up. No. Okay. Um, at this point, we can have the uh, uh, applicant, if they'd like to come up, and um, we can uh, discuss the environmental analysis. Okay. Hello. Hi. My, my name is Scott Felix. I'm with Hutton Companies. Uh, we have a presentation on both okay that I would like to give now if that's okay if that is different than what you're trying to do you, you you let me know how you want to do this we have a presentation on the the development and the environmental that's sort of bundled into one batch and we could do that now and then address the the two pieces together, uh, or I can just answer questions. Um, yeah, why don't we go ahead and do that? If you want to go ahead and make your presentation, but uh, the first part of our discussion, I'd like to focus on the environmental. Of course. And then uh, get that out of the way before we move to the project. Of course. I, I, that, I, we, I, I'd want to do that in, in uh, uh, step by step. So go ahead and make your presentation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning Commission, my name is Scott Felix, I'm with Hutton Companies, and I'd like to introduce to you Los Alamitos Luxury Apartments. Brief history on Hutton Companies, we're an Orange County-based firm. We've been in Orange County for 40 years. We're active in the development and operations of real property in Orange County, Los Angeles, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties. Uh, noteworthy development that we did here on the bottom left is the Sheriff's Administrative Headquarters the Environmental Management Agency where we built and leased those facilities to the County of Orange. 
Uh, you may be aware of our Hutton Center development at the 55 and 405 freeway. We've developed almost 4 million square feet of commercial office and about 2,500 residential units. Los Alamitos Luxury Apartments is a planned 107 unit community. We're located on the former Monty Collins backhoe and equipment site. It's important to note Los Alamitos Luxury Apartments features modern floor plans and we have more parking than any housing development in the city of Los Alamitos. We're offering amenities and resident services that are not currently available in the city. We meet all the requirements, every single one of the R3 zoning. We meet objectives of the housing element and we have a favorable staff report. I'm gonna show you a couple pictures of communities that we've developed from the ground up that were at one point very similar to the Cullen site. You can see the architectural uh, attention to detail, the meticulous landscaping, outside gathering areas for residents to socialize and meet one another, interior facilities that are well appointed, designed by professional designers. You can see the detail in the kitchen with the stonework, the upgraded cabinetry, a very high end first class apartment community is what we construct. You'll notice interior features like very large walk-in closets, very large bathrooms, wood flooring, two-toned paint, ceiling fans, crown molding, a, a, a luxury community in every sense of the word. So here's where the site is. We're located on Cerritos, just east of Coyote Creek. And if we drill in a little tighter, you'll see we're the L-shaped parcel. We have frontage on Cerritos, Sausalito, and Chestnut. A very brief history of the site, the Collins family, who's in the room today, Collins and Slimmer family, have worked on this site since the 1970s. Multiple CUPs were issued over time. Eventually, it became uh, conventional wisdom that the industrial uses and the neighboring R3 communities were a bad interface. In 2015, the city created a general plan amendment and changed the zoning from light industrial to R3. In summer of 2017, the buildings on site were demolished. I think this is a powerful perspective. You can see the first, the top photo is the site in 1983 from the bridge over Cerritos. And we tried to recreate this photograph in the last month or so, also on the bridge over Cerritos. This is, in every sense of the word, a gateway location. This is what people see when they enter the city coming from Long Beach or the 605. What we want to do is make this a favorable first impression that people get of the city of Los Alamitos versus the current condition that you see today and the historical uses that were there in the past. I'm going to show briefly a couple photos of the original use of the site. You see the construction equipment that was stored on the site. And most importantly, that construction equipment was trucked off of the site almost daily on either trucks or flatbed trailers. Part of what I mentioned earlier about the bad interface between the residential community and the industrial uses. So that use is, has closed. The Collins family relocated their business off site. Brief photos of the condition before demolition last summer. The financial benefits to the city of Los Alamitos. The current property tax rate will be reassessed at approximately 30 times what Collins is currently paying. There will be significant impact fees paid, about $470,000, and new residents with disposable income for local shops and restaurants. You can see right here, $10,000 per year is what Collins and Slimmer currently pay in property tax. That number will be over $300,000 today after this is completed. 470,000 right here in impact fees. And it's important to remember that in December of 2017, an urgency ordinance was passed by the city council. This development has 36 parking spaces that no other community in the city is subject to. So there's 36 additional guest parking spaces on this community. Our application was deemed complete on March 6th 2018 so that's the code in which we're locked in and that's the code in which we're dealing with today 
our development team. Many of the folks on this list are here today. The owner developer is Los Alamitos Luxury Apartments, which consists of the Hutton Companies, which I spoke of briefly, the Collins and Slimmer family, our architect, KTGY Group, who designed every apartment community that you've seen pictures of, is in the audience today. Cask Engineering, Portrait is our general contractor. We, Hutton, will provide construction and asset management services, and Western National provides property management. This team has worked on over 1,000 units, and we have a program. We know what to do, and we know how to execute and develop a first-class community. Every single code that is subject to the R3 zoning, setbacks, height, density, open space, parking, every single code requirement is met or exceeded. I can talk about each of these individually in more detail if desired, but every single one is met. I think this is a powerful exhibit. Open space is important. It's important to us. We have 41% of the site area that's covered. You can see the massive amounts of open space right here, and we're only covering 41% of the site. The requirement's 50, so we comfortably meet that. Building materials. We'll have elaborate barrel-tiled roof, multiple exterior colors to break up the elevation and keep it aesthetically pleasing to residents and people driving by. We'll have materials like wood, enhanced wrought iron, stonework, so we have a very attractive exterior of the community. Just some brief building elevations to show. Energy efficient and sustainable elements. This is something that's important to us and important, important to our customers. We have energy star rated appliances and high efficiency HVAC units. We're designed to meet the stringent California Title 24 energy codes and HERS ratings. We have native drought tolerant landscaping, low consumption irrigation systems and smart controller for weather based watering, high density insulation and dual pane windows, the very popular electrical vehicle charging stations, which older communities can't compete with, and we meet all of the current waste, recycling, green waste and organic waste requirements. Support from the public. We've received countless letters of support from the public, and as of this morning, last time I checked with city staff, we haven't received a single negative comment from the public about this development. At the November 14th tra trans Traffic Commission meeting, there was zero community concern, attendees, or opposition. The folks at 3131 Catella next door uh, believe quality new residential housing within walking distance makes 3131 Catella more marketable to sophisticated businesses so they can serve the entire range of the employment spectrum and all income levels and provide housing within close proximity. This touches on the environmental information that was mentioned earlier. PlaceWorks completed an initial study last fall. Los Alamitos luxury apartments will have no impacts or less than significant environmental impacts. On the basis of the initial city, the city has con on the basis of the initial study, the city has concluded that the project will not have a significant effect on the environment. Some of the areas studied include population housing, transportation traffic, air quality, land use and planning, all with no significant impact on the environment. We meet the requirements of the general plan zoning. And all of this is built on top of the 2015 environmental impact report that was prepared for the city. The proposed project, project has been designed and would be developed in accordance with applicable development standards of the city's zoning code, including those related to building height and setbacks, walls and screening, parking, landscaping, and building and site plan design. Therefore, implementation of the proposed project would not conflict with the city's zoning code. No land use impact would occur and no mitigation measures are necessary. Positive comments from the staff report. No negative comments from former community development director Stephen Mendoza during his tenure. The design and layout of the proposed development would not interfere with the use and enjoyment of neighboring developments. The buildings are of an architectural style that generally complements nearby homes. The property is zoned for this type of development and designed 
and the design of the proposed development would maintain and enhance the attractive, harmonious, and orderly development contemplated by this chapter. The mitigation measures identified in the mitigation negative declaration would ensure safety of the inhabitants of the project as well as other residents of Los Alamitos. This, the proposed development would not depreciate property values in the vicinity. The project has been compared to the development standards of the multifamily residential zone and has been found to be compliant. The city strives to ensure an adequate supply of housing is available to meet future and existing housing needs of all economic segments of the community. You'll see here the additional 36 spaces that are required under the urgency ordinance. We meet that right here in the shaded area in yellow. You'll see the perimeter landscaping is extensive and these detailed quads were ha that have recreational, um, recreational amenities such as pool, outdoor fire pits, residential lounge areas. We have on-site management and oversight. That's something a lot of communities in, in Los Alamitos do not have. We have highly trained and well compensated community managers and assistant managers. We have on-site leasing staff. We have on-site resident employees. We have a full-time maintenance staff of three. We have courtesy patrol daily and nightly. 24 hours or less maintenance repair service. We have parcel pending lockers, which I will touch on in a moment in more detail. And we have online by phone and in-person work order requests. Our residents require certain services and have detailed requirements. Those requirements include a gated community, strictly enforced rules and regulations, on-site management, high-speed cable internet connection, dedicated parking per unit, beautiful exterior architecture and landscaping, fully ADA accessible, elevator served buildings, a sense of community and organized community events. We'll have a resort style pool with spa, barbecue areas for residents, resident storage throughout the community, outdoor fireplaces and seating areas, indoor outdoor lounges and kitchen areas and, and in, kitchen and entertaining areas, modern gym adjacent to the pool, enhanced interior design upgraded with quartz countertops and wood fl flooring. We're next to the Coyote Creek bike path and we have dog washing stations. You'll see our elaborate public space with a significant lobby for residents and prospective residents to enter, on-site leasing, on-site manager, an elaborate fitness center with the same equipment that you'll find in an LA Fitness or, or membership-based gym. You have an elaborate lounge area for residents with indoor-outdoor spaces, full kitchen for residents to mingle with one another and get to know their neighbors. I'm gonna show briefly as I conclude some pictures of communities that we built, again, from the ground up. We operate to this day. You'll see the attention to architectural detail and maintenance. Elaborate interior design. Outdoor areas with amenities such as large screen TVs and fireplaces and attractive outdoor furniture. Indoor public spaces that can be used for resident events. Photograph of our gym. Outdoor barbecue areas that are extensive. Outdoor fire pits, which are great gathering places in the evening. Billiards rooms. This is a parcel pending locker, which many of you probably aren't familiar with. A problem in almost every residential community are deliveries. It's not uncommon for thieves to follow delivery people around. They drop the package on the front door. The thief is right behind them. They come and they steal the package. What happens here is our residents can order anything they want online. It's delivered. They get a text the second it's delivered. Once they get that text, they come when it's convenient for them. The dedicated room is open 24 hours a day. They get their package safely and securely. And we eliminate any risk of any sort of theft from delivery. It's very important for the people in the Planning Commission to remember what we are. We are an engaged owner developer who retains long-term ownership of the communities we create. Los Alamitos Luxury Apartments fully meets all our three multifamily zoning requirements. We meet the urgency interim zoning ordinance and have a favorable staff report. 
what we aren't. We are not old dilapidated multifamily housing without cohesive design that does not comply with current parking codes. Many rental properties in the cities are held by absentee owners with no incentive to maintain their properties due to the lack of new inventory. Most individually held rental properties in the city of Los Alamitos do not have management or maintenance staff on site accessible to residents. I'm available to expand on any of the points in this presentation that the planning commissioners have questions about now or in the near future. Okay. All right. Um, before I open it to the public, I do have some questions. I'd like to, if we could focus on the uh, environmental uh, aspect of the site. Um, and then, uh, so the questions of, of the applicant at this point, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, limit to the environmental uh, aspects of it, and then uh, we can move <laughs> forward from that, and then we can open it to the public if anybody wishes to comment on the, on the environmental component, and then we can uh, uh, maybe quickly move to a decision on that, and then move into the overall project and any questions of the applicant, and then uh, public comment, and then move forward with that. We'll just break it up so that we do this in sequence, uh, and that way we don't get uh, bogged down. All right. Um, uh, I do have some questions right out of the uh, right out of the box regarding, and this has this will have to do with the uh, portion of the environmental document that deals with. Um, and it's, I'll be starting on page 75 of the document, if you want to get to it. It'll have to do with hazardous materials associated with the project site conditions. And I want to just uh, kind of frame it up a little bit. Uh, it has nothing to do with what we just, the project. I mean, it has everything to do with the site, not with the structures that are going on it and, and that aspect of it. I think it's beautiful. I mean, but this is the part, uh, at least for me, that I want to focus on. And then if anybody else has any comments if you could come in. And to kind of set it up, my, my concern is with the hazardous, uh, the hazardous waste that are currently on the property that have to be remediated and with the ongoing monitoring that is going to be required. And, um, and also on page uh, 81, the four mitigation measures that are outlined uh, in the uh, environmental document uh, that at least it says will, quote, ensure that the impacts are reduced to a level of less than significant. So I want to kind of touch on that to kind of frame it. Uh, the history of the site that uh, was given, there, there is a, uh, the prior history of the site that, that starts with the uh, that there was an oil refinery located on the site from 1938 to 1947, followed by a uh, chemical uh, pesticide company uh, in the uh, uh, on up into the 40s. There were underground tanks in the 50s, uh, a batching company, whatever that is, uh, in the 50s to the 80s, and then the Collins family came in after that. I believe a batching company is involved in the production of concrete. Okay, and so that's, then, that's all organic. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, and then in 2002, uh, I guess they, they uncovered lead lead deposit or it was uh, Excel paving uh, did work on a storm drain and uh, they had to stockpile soil and they later found uh, detectable concentrations of lead. Having said all of that, I, just to set it up that there is a bit of contamination on the site that does have to be remediated, that happens, I have no problem with it. Now, coming to the questions uh, that I have, and that is the, uh, uh, the ongoing, why the ongoing monitoring of the site uh, following the remediation. Uh, why is that necessary? Sure, I, I can explain that uh, in layman's terms. We have our technical expert, Anna, in the audience to my immediate left who was, who has been the environmental quarterback of this operation. Okay. There's, there's certain hydrocarbons and 
lead in certain locations on the site in the soil, that soil needs to be remediated by either disposing of some of it off site or cleaning through certain approved measures through the water board. And that soil is what created a portion of the issue in the groundwater. The groundwater by nature is very salty and it's very shallow since we're this close to the ocean. It is not drinkable and it is not used for drinking water under any, surf, any, and under any circumstance. So what's happening here is we, are, we will clean the soil. Once the soil is cleaned, then for an ongoing period of time, the groundwater will be monitored to manage that process. So that's the final step in the process. The first step is remediation of the existing soil, which is the source of the influence on the groundwater. All right. And, uh, and the purpose of the monitoring is to ensure that there is no return of the uh, contamination to any levels that would be unacceptable. It is a, it is a requirement of the water board. I believe, I believe the numbers 14 wells are, have been called out for with specific locations and they will be monitored on an ongoing basis to the satisfaction of the water board which has jurisdiction over this type of issue. Okay, the question is, uh, another question is that uh, on page 80 of the document uh, uh, and following completion of it and, and the installation of the groundwater of the monitoring wells, it says that the uh, wells would conduct quarterly, ground quarterly groundwater monitoring for up to three years. It says for up to three years in one portion, it says for a minimum of three years in another portion. So we have a conflict here. I don't know which is correct. Um, and then, uh, and then any additional actions may be required based on the results. In other words, further, further uh, remediation, I would assume that means. How is that going to be done uh, if, uh, if you're, you have occupants in the property and if the, if the, uh, I'm, I'm going to let Anna, go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna I, mean, let Anna I, I have a concern for, you have people on site that are living there and, and now you have a return, if you, if you have a return of the contaminants. We have that same concern and I think Anna yeah, can go give ahead. you a good answer. Um, thanks. I'm Anna Amarandos from Rutan and Tucker Law Firm, and as Scott said, I've been uh, assisting the project proponent with the environmental side of this, the approvals. Uh, we're working with the Water Board f since 2016 to do a really comprehensive assessment of the site, design a remedial plan for the project. Um, one distinction I just wanted to make about the groundwater is when you're working with the Water Board, one of the issues we look at for the remediation is what possible exposure that anybody at the site that is part of the project might have to the contaminants in the soil or the groundwater. At this project, there is no exposure to the project, either future site occupants, future residents, uh, landscape workers, or construction workers, except there's a few construction workers that might possibly interact with the groundwater. So the groundwater piece really has to do with the other role that the water board plays in addition to making sure that this site is safe for residential occupancy. They also are tasked in the state of California, they are the agency tasked with protecting groundwater resources. And even though the groundwater is degraded and it's not a supply of drinking water for the project or any other project, nevertheless all water surface water and groundwater in california is presumed to have beneficial use so the water board by its mission they have to be concerned about preserving and protecting to the extent possible or feasible the groundwater as a possible resource and so the groundwater monitoring really the purpose of that is after we've removed the contamination in the soil, and that's the source, as Scott said, you know, rainwater infiltrates and it makes it, those contaminants can make their way into the groundwater. And we do have some shallow groundwater impacts, you know, under the project site. But once you remove the source, which is the soil, the impacted soil, then y the groundwater should, over time, those, those impacts break down, they attenuate, and they naturally degrade. 
the other thing we're doing at the bottom of our excavations, which go down to 10 feet, and the water is, it varies, but the, the water table goes up and down. In that zone, we are going to be laying into the soil amendments that have to do with, basically you can think of them, they're oxygen re releasing compounds, but they, they stimulate the natural bacteria that breaks down these contaminants in the groundwater. So the reason for the monitoring is to confirm over time that the work we did in the soil and that these amendments did the job that they were designed to do. And so we look to make sure that the concentrations of the contaminants that are in the groundwater are either stable or diminishing. Uh, you ask the question, well, what happens if they're not? Like, say That's that, question. say you're two years into that three-year period, and it's impossible to really precisely predict the time. The three years, two to three years, is the kind of normal like, quarterly monitoring. And if it looks like the conditions are stable, decreasing, and then the water board will, at that time, ha uh, say the, the wells can be abandoned closed. That's a technical term for how they, they, they call it abandoned. But it doesn't mean you just walk away. You, could t you do it the correct way. Um, and then, then you are issued, you know, the final closure. So there is the possibility of still treating groundwater even though the project is fully developed. So finally get around to answering your question, which was a good one. Um, you have the wells that are, that are going down into the, and our wells are, we have two, they're screened at intervals between 20 and 40 feet, basically. There's some shallower ones that are up to 20 and then some that go down to 40. But you can put more of the types of compounds that I mentioned that release oxygen and stimulate the natural degradation of the what's primarily petroleum hydrocarbons in, in the groundwater. So that's what, that you can still, you have the wells that are there and that is something that is available um, to take one additional measure if it's needed. It, it usually is not. The uh, and that leads to another question. You're talking about the water. I guess my concern is is the the effect of, of any contaminants that could be floating on the water table uh, affecting coming up into the soil and then and then migrating up, uh, migrating up and uh, leading to a, a contamination of the of this you know further contamination of the site. Uh, and and uh, I, I guess that's that's the question I have. We don't You're, have that many volatile chemicals in the groundwater at this site. Um, it's primarily a hydrocarbon site. And while it is possible, and in fact, contaminants do come off groundwater and come through the soil column, uh, right. and th that creates like a soil vapor condition. Yes. Um, we don't think it's very likely. It, it certainly would not affect any site occupants, um, even if that were to happen, because keep in mind, this site, when fully developed, is going to be covered by buildings, pavement, and concrete. We have no residents on the first floor. We have no first floor residential occupancy. So there's no vapor intrusion possibility. Um, the only, the only, bill, the only uh, room, the leasing office would have an occupant okay. during the day and that will have a vapor barrier. That, that, that's in the remediation plan. That, that well that's my question. If, if there's no possibility, why, why is there a vapor barrier uh, just to required. be conserved. Well, for one thing, y you you never get every single molecule out of the soil. You know that's just the nature of remediation. We have ten excavation areas in the remediation plan, and we're going to be r removing or treating on site a, a very large volume of soil. But um, y you never get every single molecule when you. It's just the it's just the nature of it. And so to it just in the complete, um, uh, just as a complete precaution to be very conservative. The one building that will have occupants that is on the first floor, that is as a ground floor, is the is the leasing office, and so that we, you know it was just a decision was just made just to do a vapor barrier, which are very common in the construction industry now. So the vapor barrier is only going to be underneath the leasing office. At any room that has. I think it's pretty much, are there any other rooms? The, none of the residential apartments are on the ground floor. Well, then let me, okay. Let none of the I, residential I hear, apartments I, let, are on then, the ground floor. Then, then this moves to my next question under mitigation measures with specifically uh, number four, that the project developer shall be required to record a separate notice to provide notification of the presence of vapor barriers, plural, where such building features are installed to future project residents. 
I take that to be the tenants. The, I, I don't know why that notice is would be needed to, for a tenant. You need, there aren't any you need, tenants. You need, that, you need that because it says here that in order to get these impacts to a level of less than significant, you have to enact these four mitigation measures, and this is one of them. And that, and that, that's my, this is my overall concern. I'll just kind of sum it up real quick. My overall concern is, is that, is that, uh, that the, that the, the requirement for, for the monitoring wells is because, it, yes, it's there to, to hopefully to, to, to find out why your, uh, you know, that, that your measures are working, you know, mm -hmm. that everything is at a lower level. But there's also the possibility that, that the uh, that this contamination can re reoccur, and it's and you have to have the vapor barriers in case no. it migrate. If it no, migrate. no, you that that really actually is not as scientifically that that's really not a possibility that you would need vapor barriers after the fact. Under any room other than this leasing office is the only the I'm told the only. Uh, I'm just the only space that reading. that is a ground floor space that will have an occupant. As Scott mentioned, there are some on-site personnel that will be in the office area, but there is no residential space on the ground floor. They, there's no possibility of vapor intrusion affecting an apartment. Okay. I, I I didn't write that mitigation measure. I'm not sure who did, so it's hard to respond specifically. But I think there may have been a misunderstanding that the notice to tenants. Might it might be needed in connection with that, but it's if I don't I don't really know why that would be. Uh, the um, the other question I had the the document seems to indicate that the the uh, oh, oh you know what uh, Scott just reminded me that these mitigate uh, these mitigation measures we think were based on the Cottonwood project next door those are condominiums and they are ground floor units um, I don't know if they have vapor barriers but they probably do well, have this vapor is what barriers. We have for this project before I, what was I think that those are the four were modeled on the next door project Okay. where that vapor intrusion issue would be much more relevant for those condos that have the ground floor residential occupancy. The, uh, one there is the inference in, in the report that, that the uh, Santa Ana, uh, what's it called? The Santa Ana Regional Water Quality Control Board, which is, I guess, mm -hmm. handling this project, yes. has approved uh, the um, the uh, groundwater remediation plan, and I've asked I asked for that from staff, and that's not it. It's that, been, that letter hasn't been it, it hasn't been approved in writing. But at our last meeting with the board, it was informally approved, and in fact, they told us to implement task number one of the groundwater work plan, which is the baseline sampling of the five monitoring wells that are currently at the site. Okay. Um, that's basically all of my, I have some comments that I'm going to reserve for a second, but, um, but I think that's all of my questions that I have regarding this, if anybody else has any other regarding comments. Um, sure. Some questions, comments. Uh, I'm, I'm reading, again, this is on page 80, and this has to do with monitoring wells, and, and at one point it says uh, they're going to monitor the wells for a period up to three years, and then, and then a couple paragraphs later it talks to uh, about monitoring them for at least three years, so I'm not sure if we're going to monitor them more than three or less than three, but when I look at uh, Santa Ana Regional Water Quality Control Board's letter, they don't give a term. They don't give an end date. In other words, it, so it leads me to assume that it, there's no there's there's no, no precise tonight. end date, and I think in the work plan, and in the remediation plan, I think we refer to maybe the reference is up to three years or typically two to three years. That is a typical monitoring time frame, but it, if it, if at the end of three years the water board thinks they need a few more quarters of data, the work will continue. <coughs> 
So we don't have a date. I mean, it could be more than three years. It could be. It could be more than three years. And, and they would decide that. The water board will decide that when they look at the groundwater at the levels data. Of contamination. It, it's really hard to predict how quickly groundwater is extremely difficult to remediate, and it's it's basically natural attenuation, which is enhanced by these chemicals. The, you know, the things we put in in the soil to speed up that process, but. It has a lot to do with the lithology of the soil the, in that groundwater zone, et cetera. You know, a lot of scientific, ge that geologists <laughs> spent time thinking about. Um, but it's hard to really predict how quickly that process happens. Typically, the water board will look, if they see, you know, two or three quarters in a row where the concentrations are diminishing, you know, then I can, I think that at the end of the, you know, two to three years in that time frame, if the, those concentrations have been coming down, they'll be satisfied that the, uh, the soil approach that we took to the excavation of the impacted soil and those amendments have worked. You know, so that's that's the, how we know they worked is you measure the concentrations in the, in the groundwater. And okay. so, it, you know, hard to predict, but it, it's typically two to three years. Okay. First of all, I like the project. Okay, I'm just concerned about the soil. and. The soil is contaminated. And it was benzene. Right. We have ethyl benzene, naphthalene, propyl Lead. benzene, propyl benzene. One here catches my eyes: chromium six, which is uh, some somewhat of a concern. But so it is contaminated. So the, uh, the water con quality control board knows it's contaminated. We yeah. all know it's contaminated. So we're going to try to mitigate that. Right. Why would we start a project before we remove the contaminants? And the reason I ask that is because I think the paramount concern of everybody here is the tenants. So there's language in here that says that you have to notify the tenants of the contamination, and the method of notification is going to be um, to record that. Uh, and I don't know what tenant, <coughs> when they're signing a lease, goes to the county recorder's office and reviews the documents to see I, Yeah, again, I think that notice to the tenants maybe was modeled after the condominium project next door. Um, this I, don't, site, I don't recall the, that in that project, but that's, be that as it may. I the don't. site will be fully remediated from a tenant's perspective. There will be... N n our remediation plan uh, explains there's no exposure pathway for a tenant to be in contact with any hazardous chemical. Well, let me ask you this now. If you're putting a vapor barrier, and, then, and that means you're concerned about water vapors percolating up through the soil, and, and these waters, if, they're, if the water's contaminated, then the vapor may be it, the, contaminated. It, there are, there are the fact that there's not going to be anybody living on the first floor, uh, is that relevant? I mean, if it's in the if it's in the structure itself, then the vapors can migrate through no, that structure. No, no, there there's no vapor intrusion issue above the the first floor. The vapor intrusion is is really widely studied, and there are vapor barriers under thousands of projects in California. But the 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 analysis is always the first floor because it doesn't. If you get a few molecules that get through the slab, they don't go through that whole airspace and into the next floor. There's just, it just doesn't happen. So, it the the issue here um, that the project was designed, you know, to to have garage. Basically, it's an open air garage op right. space on the ground floor, and other than the leasing office, that's the only place you will have people in an enclosed space that's on the ground floor. And just from the very beginning of the project, just to be conservative, we determined that we would do a vapor barrier. And the vapor, the materials for vapor barrier are very similar to a moisture barrier. So it's, some, it's a, a product that is you know, used in construction. Vapor mitigation, there's a few more elements to it than just a sheet of plastic. Understood. But, but you know, it's a pretty common material, so we just planned to do that under that space that has people working during the day. Got it. No, thank you. But let's get back to notification. If there was mm -hmm. concern enough to put language in here that you're no going to notify the tenants, then why would you? Why? I mean, it seems to me again, if you're going to uh, record, they don't this, know why the, the tenants have to be notified. Why they going to? No tenant's going to go look at, and see <laughs> that. We'd, we'd be happy to notify the tenants or residents if it's a requirement of the water board. That if, if that's one of the issues we're discussing, there's a willingness to fully disclose anything and everything that needs to be fully disclosed to all residents. I, I understand, but if it became a requirement of the water board, 
there's a willingness to do whatever the water board asks us to do. I think it's important to remember on the site next door, the Olson site, which had a lot of these same elements, we're probably six to nine months behind them at the water board. They've sort of been the trailblazer on this process. The water board wants to have um, a bit of parity between the two sites. They have ground floor residents next door. I believe they have vapor barriers on their slabs. We do not have ground floor residents. The only ground floor structure we have is approximately 1,500, 2,000 square feet of amenities and a leasing building, and we will put vapor, vapor barriers on that structure. Uh, there was something that was mentioned, I believe, about chromium-6, and I right. was just told there, there is not chromium-6 on the site. Well, this, uh, this correspondence from the water board disagrees with you. If, if we can see the specific point, I think we can, we can address that. You can have this if you want. Page six of the water, page six of the water board's letter in the little June, chart. June 29th, uh, 2018, water board letter, page six. All oh, very minor. It may be minor to you, but I think somebody moving in as a tenant with the family may want to have, make that decision on their own. No, no. The Chrome 6 is an issue for groundwater, but it's not volatile. There's no volatilization. It's not a vapor intrusion issue. Some of these other chemicals on that list, um, benzene, et cetera, those are, those are volatile, but uh, Chrome 6 is an issue for drinking water, basically, that, that kind of exposure. So it should, yeah, I had, it's a minor chemical at this site. I'd forgotten that it, it was even detected. You know. Okay. Any other questions oh, uh, of the applicant? I'm going to open it to the public and then let them comment, and then uh, and then we can bring it back for further discussion. I'm sorry. Do you have any? If there's any other questions of the applicant uh, regarding not the, at this time. Okay. What I'll do at this point, I'd like to, this is a public hearing. I'll open it uh, for members of the public if they'd like to come forward, and if if they have any uh, comments or issues pertaining to the environmental component that we're talking about, that would be appreciated. We'll, if it's a project overall, the structures, et cetera, we'll handle that in a little bit. So, uh, Chair DeMond, I do have some environmental related uh, questions regarding traffic, but I think we want to, do you want to deal with Let's just finish up on this and then move to the, move to the traffic. Um, is there anyone wishing to address any of the environmental concerns that we've been speaking? Okay. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. I'm John Underwood. Um, I do come a, a little late to this project, admittedly. And uh, however, I do bring with me a little history. And um, I have no qualms about the project itself or the, um, the way that the uh, developers have presented it tonight. It sounds like a wonderful you know, adjunct to our community. But I'm worried about this notion of overlapping between mitigation processes, subterranean mitigation processes, and development and occupancy of those grounds. We have a number of uh, conditions in Los Alamitos and throughout this whole basin resulting from a very broad and shallow aquifer table that exists here that go back as far as World War II and the Korean War, where the base here utilized uh, uh, this area out in this, this broad area of this, uh, this, this plain uh, that was used for their uh, uh, dumping, essentially, of uh, toxins like jet A fuel. And I realize the aquifer is a dynamic condition. And I have seen, though, some of the underground subterranean aquifer maps that cover this area. And they're very broad and wide. And they reflect some of the contamination problems we've had in Los Alamitos that have been addressed and some not addressed. 
we still have a very active contamination area uh, at the corner of Cerritos and Los Alamitos Boulevard, one that is still in mitigation and will be in mitigation uh, not very far from this production site uh, that as, as the engineers out there and the field ha uh, hands out there tell me is ongoing for years to come in terms of uh, uh, ground mitigation and water table mitigation, both. They're doing testing out there right now. Some grounds have been uh, uh, relieved of their brownfield onus, and, and there is development occurring now in Los Alamitos. But I would caution the city that there may be legal exposure down the road, and that's why I believe the city should get involved in this project. I'm reminded of, uh, I have, I'm just old enough to remember a um, uh, few decades ago the uh, Cypress Tank Farm controversy in which uh, it, it took the city of Cyprus put on blinders essentially to, the, to what was a tank farm out there turned into a, a very high uh, scale uh, development of single family homes and there, and there was uh, contamination through the ground and there was uh, uh, attempts by local community members to implicate the city itself for being remiss in uh, not looking directly at the mitigation problems that were required before development actually started. And that turned into a, a real can of worms for the city of Cyprus and could do so for the city of Los Alamitos if we're not careful and move forward in a, a very measured and uh, transparent way. And that's uh, all I have to say about the project, but I, I would caution the city to be vigilant uh, because there were expenses and there, were, uh, there was litigation uh, around this Cypress tank farm and brought by the community itself after they made claims of cluster cancer cases resulting from groundwater contamination, resulting from soil contamination. And I think it should be a cautionary tale for this city when we do move forward with this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just, is there any, any other member of the public wishing to comment on this? Okay, I'll close the public hearing. I'll bring the applicant back up and. Just like to respond to a couple of those points very quickly. Okay. Uh, first and foremost, the water board, their charter, their objective is safety. That's what they're about. That's what they're trying to regulate. Um, and I, I think we're, we're missing an issue here. No construction can occur until the water board approves the remediation. We've agreed to mitigate as required by all agencies. And if the cleanup is the focus, we cannot spend money on remediation if we don't have an agreement on a development plan. So the two, the two go together and they're dual tracked. And nothing will get built until the soils issue is resolved to the satisfaction of the water board. The water board's been heavily involved in this process for approximately two years. They're on site, they know everything we do before we do it, they approve everything that happens, all the testing. And the water board's objective with their scientists, their geologists, and their engineers. They're looking at this all very closely. They know what these standards are. They know what is safe. And there are many properties in this condition, for example, Olson next door, that have ground floor units. We are even safer than them because we do not have ground floor units. We only have second floor residential units. So I think those points are important to keep in mind. Okay. Again, I, I would, uh, I will just comment that again. Reading what we have in front of us is what we have in front of us. You know, this this is the document that we have to deal with, plus the the others that we obtain. So I, I I hear what you say, but I'm referring to the document that we have. And commenting on that, j just your last comment. It says here that as the uh, this is a, again page 80 under conclusion. Uh, last paragraph, uh, last, just about the second to last sentence, it says, as the SARWQB, the monitoring board, 
is requesting monitoring of at least three years prior to issuing a closure letter, the project development would be allowed to proceed to such clo cl proceed to such closure letter proceed would allowed to proceed prior to such closure letter being obtained. I. I, I where who is giving that allowance to proceed prior to is that us or the board I guess that's the question that I have of the uh, staff is that our decision to allow the, the project to proceed or is it the is it the uh, monitoring board makes that decision I the attorney said that they they don't get into that so I I'm I'm in a quandary here it seems to me that it's up to us to make that decision they the the monitoring board will require monitoring for three years prior to issuing their letter uh, and, and in order to ensure impacts are reduced to a level of less than significant if we do allow it to proceed then the revised remedial action plan and addendum are to be uh, implemented as necessary and that's then listing these four items that somehow these four items are going to ensure that the impacts reduce to a level less than significant, i.e., the notice, your apartment regulations having to uh, note that there's required monitoring. I don't understand how that can have an effect on whether or not a chemical is going to percolate up. It, it doesn't. The, the, the groundwater, I'll just emphasize again, the groundwater monitoring is really about protecting groundwater. It really is unrelated to the project. Okay, fine. Okay. And that's why the project can proceed after all of the soil work is done. And this is a common practice throughout California and other states as well, is once that soil work, all the soil, impacted soil has been removed and backfilled with clean soil, then the, then the project grading can move forward, the utilities can be installed, foundations, footings, because the soil is now clean. And then after the apartments are built, then those groundwater monitoring wells are installed for long-term monitoring that really has nothing to do with the project that you're approving. It has to do with the protection of water resources. So the question I have then, so, so what you're saying, let me just summarize it. So what you're saying is, is that there is no chance that, that the, uh, once the soil is removed, there is no chance that the water table any contaminants that may be existing on the water table that may be, that, that could migrate in maybe from somewhere else or even from the site, that, that those will have no uh, impact on the soil under the project nor allow any of the vapors to percolate up. I mean, you that's could what, get that's a, what you, you're, you, that's what I'm you're saying. I'm not saying that could have no impact on, on a soil. Uh, there could be a very minor amount of soil vapor, but the surface of the project is impervious. It's covered with concrete, buildings, and asphalt. It is virtually capped, except for a few little landscaped borders. And those have five feet of clean soil underneath them. So there is no building um, that would be susceptible to any kind of vapor intrusion. I mean, even if, setting aside the groundwater, there could be a few minor residual vapors in the soil. This is true of any project that undergoes remediation. but. The water board not only have their geologists and hydrogeologists reviewed these plans and approved them, they also consulted a sister agency who uh, had a toxicologist. The water board does not have any toxicologists. Somebody whose sole view and perspective is human health risk, who reviewed the remediation plan and risk assessment, and it has been approved. You know, considering the groundwater, the questions you have, all of those things have been reviewed by um, a multi-dimensional staff of experts at the Water Board and its sister agency within Cal EPA the, that does toxicology uh, con consultation with the board. But they haven't approved the plan yet. We don't have any. And, and those, it's in the remediation plan that this project will proceed after the soil phase, after the soil remediation is complete. And it's, it's extremely common that groundwater monitoring occurs there are projects, like I said, all over Orange County in California that have, that are much more seriously impacted than this one, where the groundwater monitoring might go on for 10 years after the project is built. 
and it's, it's virtually uh, transparent. It, 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 the people that live there are totally unaware in these cases. You know, the, it's and, and these groundwater, th these, these wells do not, uh, do not detect the volatile, the benzenes and the other, the other solvents that could be floating on the water table. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, that, that could be, uh, you know, the, the water table ebbs and flows, it rises and falls depending upon the, the time of the year and, mm -hmm. the, and, the, and the, uh, the rainfall that we get. Right. You know, it comes up and, 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 and then it, 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 it goes into the soil and then it percolates up. It, but never, never higher than at this site, uh, about uh, 11, 12, 13 feet is the shallowest. It doesn't come all the way up to you know where the buildings are. It, that's why you have a vapor the vapor barrier. The right? shallowest is is about 11 feet, and, so you don't and, need it, the vapor and it, it goes down to right. 15, 16 right. feet in some places. Yeah, I, I will just I'll, I'll just conclude. I I, I uh, appreciate Mr. Uh, uh, Underwood. Underwood's comment. I uh, we lived here a while as well, long enough to remember the Lou Webb property, that where the uh, uh, that was contaminated. And they're now building building a hotel over there, but uh, for 30 years that's remained uh, vacant because of the contaminants that seem to ebb and flow. They would be remediated. We would have various projects come in, and not, not maybe not make it to the city, but but they started to come in, and then they would do some uh, uh, testing because they were sure it was all remediated, and it's back. And then. More remediation occurred for periods of years, then another project would come in, starting with produce stored. Uh, I can't remember all the different ones. And they had their monitoring wells. They, they, they did all of that. But for some reason, these contaminants just seemed to keep coming up to the point where it would, uh, they, they couldn't, couldn't do anything with the site. I, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, my concern, I like the project. Got no problem with the project. My concern is on these mitigation ma that that it's almost as if you're jumping the gun. If 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 the if you clean it and you, you you do a good job with that, they put the monitoring wells in. They want it for three years to basically to make sure that that everything has worked. I mean, I I, I would err on the side of caution for the tenants that and the people who are going to live there. Okay, that that God forbid the the contaminants somehow penetrate the uh, uh, the the quote impervious you know asphalt or whatever concrete and all this stuff that's there or around there and creates a problem. That that's a concern that I have. All of and this was studied in the Place Works initial study and mitigated negative declaration, and they concluded there are no significant environmental impacts. I believe it's Appendix D as in dog and E as in Edward. No, no, it is significant, but it'll be it'll be reduced to less than significant if you if you follow these measures for whatever whatever that term. Well, and and the water relates board, to the water board's been involved in this process again for about two years. And if you look at the June 29th, 2018 letter, midway down, it says we approve the proposed work as outlined. And so, if there's an environmental concern, and the concern is the condition on the site and the groundwater to go forward and do the work is what we're here and what we're ready, willing, and able to do. That's what we're trying to do right now. I guess the concern I have would be, uh, would be occupancy. We do not want occupants in an unsafe condition. Well, nobody. You have the exact condition next door with Olson. They're building homes on the ground floor they're under construction right now, and I believe they're very close to completing their soils work. So it's, it's happening in, in your city, and it's happening right next door on a site that has a very similar soils condition that our site has. All of the scientists, geologists, engineers at the Water Board and at OHIA have looked at this very closely for all sorts of toxicology issues, and they are comfortable with our plan. Okay. If I can maybe just help answer the process question, yes. not all the questions that you have, but if you, if you turn to the mitigation measures, so the way this is, there's two agencies that are involved in the, the remediation site. There's the County of Orange, Orange County Healthcare Agency, their environmental department, 
they'll have oversight over the remediation to the soil. And it, it's not until that department gives the soil a clean bill of health that any building or construction permits can get issued. And secondarily, this, this, the uh, water, wa Regional Water Quality Control Board will monitor the groundwater. And if the mitigation measure doesn't talk in terms of three years, up to three years, or three years, it just says that they will continue to monitor the site until the Regional Water Quality Control Board issues a regulatory closure letter. So I think there was a comment made earlier that it could go on for 10 years. So I think at least the mitigation measure, which really controls, uh, doesn't contemplate any infinite time frame. It just says you keep monitoring until the Water Quality Control Board is satisfied that uh, no more contaminants are going to get into the groundwater. So that just answers the but that, that, that but that but that is growing that is the contaminants then going into the groundwater from the site but what about the contaminants uh, uh, if, if if the uh, I guess what I what I'm losing here is is the or not maybe not maybe not understanding is the purpose of the monitoring well is to monitor the groundwater, but on the groundwater uh, y you could have the contaminants. We, we've had this situation before where the contaminants uh, are there and they're, they're, uh, uh, they're in the groundwater, all right, and, and they percolate up. I mean, I, I have that, to... That is, th the, that, is a, that is a legitimate concern for projects that have first floor, ground floor occupancy. Um, now, at this site, the, we essentially have the entire site is just about capped with impervious material. So in a sense, that is a vapor barrier, and then you have residents only on the second floor. And vapor intrusion is an o only an issue on the first floor. But I just, I just want to point out again that the city doesn't have this, obviously, no city has the level of expertise that you have at your state agencies. And the state's toxicologists, geologists, and hydrogeologists have all been involved in every phase of this project. And, you know, the city can obviously condition the project approvals on the approvals of those other respons uh, responsible agencies. Now, I think that one of the mitigation measures refers to the county confirming that the soil remediation was completed. And in this case, it's actually the state water board is the lead agency for the remedial work. And I'm not sure if that is a typo, a, a, an error. Maybe that was modeled on some other site. But I think it's the state agency. And I'm assuming that the city, as one of its conditions of approval, will be that this is the agency that has the expertise to make the kinds of decisions we're talking about here that the residents are safe, that construction workers for the project are safe, landscaping workers in the future of the project that are changing sprinklers, <coughs> et cetera, planting plants in the borders, they are safe. All of those, every aspect of our health risk assessment looked at each of those types of workers or residents to see if there was an exposure and to make sure that, that our cleanup plan was conservative enough so that any residual contamination was below the levels that would be a risk to any of those types of site occupants, so for all of those categories. And right. you know, so we're, we're asking you to, to rely on the state's resources, that they have people who, you know, this is their expertise. And um, of course, you know, the condition of the project being the approval of that oversight agency. Right. I, okay, any other comments? Um, I'd like to ask the city attorney, as a follow-up to what John said regarding, you know, a possible lawsuit, what exposure does the city have if we approve it? I mean, we're certainly, the state's going to be the one saying the ground's fine, the water's fine. Do we have exposure to a lawsuit? Well, uh, uh, Honorable Chair and members of the board, whenever a client asked me that, I said yes. <laughs> Anybody can sue. Uh, whether that lawsuit would have any merit against the city, I, I, the answer would be no. Okay. Uh, because the, the state agencies and the county agencies and other agencies that are involved in determining whether or not the site's been properly remediated, 
uh, would be the primary defendants. But the reality is that city would probably be brought into the lawsuit as well. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I guess my, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I just feel my my uh, I guess our, our just our institutional institutional knowledge seems to conflict with with some of the uh, I'll say the the comments that we've had we we've at least I have uh, first I, ha I have knowledge of the of the like the Lou website and other sites where these contaminants do come up I am of the opinion that uh, uh, you know the, the they could go ahead and, and do their remediation. They can put their wells in. They can monitor their wells, and when and when when they get their closure letter, then then proceed with their construction and proceed with the development of the property. It just seems to me that 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 it's like putting the cart before the horse a little bit here, or or uh, jumping the gun a little bit, so to speak. Well, to and, and 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 the the. The rationale for that is is that we're not we're not dealing with a parking lot. We're not dealing with a commercial structure. We're not dealing with a hotel with transient occupants. We're dealing with a residence. Okay, uh, with all due respect, the vapors go only go to the first floor. I, you know, a gas is a gas is a gas, and it's it's uh, if it's if it can get to the first floor, it's going to get to the second floor. This this and, and, and I'm just this is just uh, this I, the scientist I'm, at the water board studied that, and I I think it's unfair. To characterize this based on the Lou Webb situation, I, I'm not. I'm because, not even. No, trying. I understand. But each, each soil has, each site has its own soil, and it's like, much like DNA. Everybody in right. this room has different DNA, and each site is studied individually based upon its unique characteristics. And this has been studied by the experts at the state, the Water Board, OEA, and they're comfortable with it. Uh, okay. Sure. Having said that, um, then why will they not allow construction until the water board gives the gives the um, gives the okay? Be because they want us to implement the RAP program. We we created a re remedial action program, which cleans or removes problematic soil, and we need to do that first. Once we do that, then the site conditions will be. Um, that's the first step, and then the board will then sign off and be monitoring this the whole time to make sure we actually do what we're supposed to do in that report. And th this report is fluid, it's important to remember. Site conditions will ebb and flow, and they will be different, slightly different than what the reports and studies say. And the water board will be out there, and they will be telling us to expand in this area or contract in this area, and our job is to do what the water board says. And that's what we're committed to doing. So again, uh, the gentleman that spoke, Mr. Underwood, talked about overlaying, uh, putting development and occupancy on the same time. And that's one of my concerns. And why can't we remediate the site before we begin construction and occupy? Because if you don't, you can be done with the construction and start occupying while you still have contamination there. Contamination of the soil or the well, groundwater? There is, there is contamination of the soil. I we mean, would we've we, admitted to that. And, we would and, and remove all of the soil contaminants before we started construction, and then we would monitor the groundwater and we would treat the groundwater if necessary as required by the water board. The reality is, if nothing happens on the site, it's going to remain in the, its exact condition, and it will it won't be treated. So, d the development is what facilitates the cleanup. I have a question for council after. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Go ahead. Can we condition the beginning construction upon getting this letter and approval from in writing from the water board? I mean, all we're hearing is hearsay here. I mean, uh, again, there's inconsistencies in the report. Um, we've got a letter from the water board that conflicts with what's in the report. Um, they're saying verbally they won't construct been constructed begin construction until the water board and I assume this water board is going to say that the that the excavation is uh, done properly because it sounds like the water board deals with water uh, but I, I, I would really not want to see construction begin until uh, 
the, remedi the remediation efforts are, are completed. And th that's in fact what, what you have with the mitigation measures in front of you, these four mitigation measures. They actually have to come in, as is occurring next door at the Olson site right now. They're remediating the soil. We have not issued a grading permit yet or any construction uh, building permits for that site. They're in the remediation process. Once the remediation is complete and the board grants approval of that stipulation or, or that they've treated it properly, then we issue grading permit, uh, grading permit and building permits. That's the same situation here. So you're, they have a tremendous amount of work to do to remediate that soil. Once that's done and the board has said it's, it's done per the plan and it's okay, then we allow for grading activity for the construction and the physical construction of the buildings. But the issue with the monitoring has to do with what happens later on with the groundwater movement that, occur, that occurs. Ground, as we've talked about, you mentioned, groundwater moves up, down, you know, horizontally and vertically over time. So there's a need to monitor that to ensure that as that groundwater is moving, it doesn't create uh, a problem or you know, bring that back in. And as was mentioned earlier, ensures that what is remaining that's at an acceptable level continues to dissipate. So they're doing both and that's why there's a quarterly monitor uh, done because if it does become a problem if it does start uh, weeping or seeping back in they're able to address that or, or, or uh, identify that and then uh, address a plan to remediate that as it's uh, even in a built environment they still can remediate with those well sites so i don't know if that hopefully answers your question but we have a mitigation measure here that says you have to remediate the site, you have to remediate the soil before you can get a grading permit from the city and a building permit for the construction of, uh, of those structures. All right. Can I have a question for Les? Um, is the city given carbon copies of all of the things from the water board and the state we don't that they are getting as well? Um, not necessarily. We, there's, there's correspondence and dialogue going on, and I'll use the project next door because that's a live mm -hmm. act, act of project. We don't know everything that's happening there. There's a lot of activity occurring. We're in contact with the developer, um, but we're not giving every bit of correspondence from the water board. Now, we can obviously reach out to them, but it's not, we're not automatically brought into that, uh, but we are directly engaging with them because we want to make sure it's been, you know, they're, they're following the process, they're remediating it, um, but really, per the conditions of approval, they're off doing that remediation, and they're not really going to necessarily come into us or have to come into us until they've got that water quality board letter to give to us that then allows us to grant the grading permit and the building permits. All right. Okay. Um, I'll open it up. To you want to give your name? Yeah, sure. Uh, Doug Dennington. I'm, I will be extremely brief. I'm also with Lieutenant Tucker. I represent the applicant. Um, most of the points um, on this have been addressed by uh, my partner, Anna Amarandos. Um, there's a comment made that all we've heard is hearsay today. That's not what we have here. We've heard a lot of hearsay. We've heard a lot of speculation. We've heard a lot of what ifs. But what you have is a huge report prepared by PlaceWorks discussing the environmental impacts. This is not a, an applicant's consultant. This is the city's consultant. We had to pay for the city's consultant, but we had no control over the city's consultant. And this is a city consultant who has reviewed, and it does have the expertise in reviewing these issues, reviewing the groundwater remediation issues, and said, look, this is a typical issue for a contaminated site. With respect to, and, and they've said, with these mitigation measures, there are no significant impacts, okay? That's the evidence that you have. Um, the other evidence you have is, I've heard the, the comments about we're jumping the gun. Olson is sitting right over the exact same groundwater, the identical groundwater, they had their own remediation problems, and they're about to build homes. So this is not an uncommon scenario. It's not um, something novel. It's something that's well within the, the regional board's expertise. And <clears throat> this body can condition any approval of our project on a clearance letter from any of the regulatory agencies that are tasked with this specific issue. 
and they do have the expertise to do this, and I can guarantee you, dealing with the regional board for as long as I have, they are not going to let anybody come into that property if there's any danger. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess I would uh, just go into these uh, hazard, uh, the last, and then we can see which direction we want to go. With respect to the mitigation measures, uh, one through four, um, <clears throat> it says here that the applicant developer should be required to record a separate notice to provide notification uh, to, to, to protect the uh, future residents. Uh, I believe that uh, we should require we're allowed to make conditions uh, that that either is part of their part of their 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 process when they're leasing a unit uh, in dealing with the prospective tenants that there be a disclosure uh, that would uh, make the tenants aware that uh, that there's ongoing monitoring on site and that. Uh, just as a matter of, of uh, transparency and disclosure to the, to the prospective tenants. We have no problem being transparent. We have no problems disclosing anything and everything we're required to disclose by okay. the Water Board. All right. And this, and this says here that, these, that this uh, notice shall be recorded, recorded and it's, uh, let's see, with proof of the notice provided future res prior to the issuance of occupancy. I would, uh, if, if this, if this proceeds or if this is approved, that uh, that the recordation should not be until the it should not occur. Uh, it should occur prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, but I believe it should be recorded uh, within uh, you know following the approval, your acceptance of the approval of the commission of the. Um, uh, of this approval, your acceptance of the approval after the 20 day, there's a 20 day appeal period that you have to wait, uh, that, that this notice be recorded at that time and not wait till the end of the project. It'll provide notice to the world, anybody interested in the project, if they do look at the record, they'll be able to see uh, that there is a remediation going on and that there's gonna be ongoing, at least for a period of three years. There, there is notice provided to the world all of this information is available on GeoTracker. It's not just available to the city, staff, and planning commissioners. It's available to anybody in the public with fine. a computer. Yeah. So all that information is readily and easily available. That's fine. As long as we can record, it's that's here, recorded on. It's, it's to be recorded at the county record, recorded on. So it is recorded and. Um, again, this isn't this isn't our consultant who did this, but this is a condition that generally applies when you have units that you can sell. It's not a condition that you would have for an apartment complex. So it's pretty clear to me that this condition was modeled after the conditions next door or the mitigation next door. I, I guess that's the only point I would make. It's an odd for for the reasons uh, Miss Amarandos had indicated it's, it's just an odd condition or mitigation measure for this apartment complex. That's what we have. Mm -hmm. Again, we're left with we're left with what we have. Mm -hmm. it, to, to bring home that point, I, it is though a mitigation measure in, in here. So yeah, I what I've what I've heard is the willingness of the applicant to record the notice, right? And then the additional re request was also to provide. A direct notice, notice to the tenant, right. which I've heard the applicant's willing to do as well. Right, and so I mean, it, it should I, be or not, it, it is a mitigation measure. It is a mitigation measure. I mean, I, I think it should be recorded, you know, after approval. I mean, and then and then leave it leave it at that. Uh, so uh, it's we are, we are willing to do whatever is required right. by the water board, and if we if we want to add or modify a blanket condition that says that. Th there's a willingness to do that. It gets a slightly complicated with, with recording documents. Um, I think we might want to have a conversation about that. 
would it be acceptable to potentially just put a little notice in the leasing office to this effect so that well, we're not writing up a lot of things that there is this ongoing process is that except possible or, or is that okay with the attorney something of that nature because I know when I've gone places to get my mail I've usually seen a notice that there's possibility of carcinogens I mean everywhere well that happens everywhere I, I believe that's prop but 65 yeah if I remember correctly and you, you do see that notice in various mm -hmm. places we, we want to do whatever standard whatever the water board requires but at the same time we also want parity with what happened next door with Olson. Well, it's, this, the recording is, yeah. one, is one of the mitigation measures. But that, you that, can that, put that, it in the leasing thing, well, we they, can do the recording, but they could put a notice well, the, in the, the leasing that, Yes, they should do, they, that's, the, that's the, an actual, you know, in front of the tenant when they're there signing their paperwork, they know what they're getting into. Whether they read it or not is a whole different issue, but I mean, but mm -hmm. at least it's, it, it, it is there. It's a, le it's a level of disclosure uh, Everything's very transparent. Like I said right. before, the the GeoTracker site, everything is public to anybody who wants to read all of these reports and studies to their heart's content. All right. Okay. Chair? Go ahead. I'm done with the soil and the groundwater. I have a few questions with regard to traffic. All right. Okay. Do we? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to move to traffic. A couple of questions for traffic. Of course. Um, at, the, at the Olson project next door, when they studied the intersections, there were a few key intersections they left off of the study, and uh, it appears that they've included them in this study. And um, it basically, it says at page 112 that the Los Alamitos will accept the LOS uh, uh, of D. Uh, this is LOS A is 10 seconds. It's a delay. I guess it's a delay. Uh, F is uh, 50 seconds, and that's unacceptable to the city. So the city apparently, according to this document, will accept a D level. Uh, on the chart on page 115, there's an error, but I think it's just a typo about the total trips. Uh, they talk about AM and PM peak hours in the total trips, and um, they do, they do, it looks like they do study the relevant intersections. And the key intersection is the one of Chestnut and Cerritos. Um, and, and again, this, this document, and again, this is what we worked off of. We didn't have all the information you have. We just sure. have, they make assumptions. They make assumptions about the traffic patterns in the build-out year of 2020, um, assuming certain things are gonna be done. And I think that's kind of inadequate or faulty to make to, to base something on something that may or may not occur. But nonetheless, moving beyond that, at the intersection of Cerritos and, and Chestnut, they talk about that being problematic uh, to a degree because of the increased um, volume. But they do uh, recognize that there's a traffic signal 300 feet to the east. So they can't put a signal at the Cerritos Chestnut intersection, which is going to be the have most heavily impacted intersection, uh, I believe, uh, as a result of this project. And what they're, how they plan to mitigate that is they're going to put a sign, they're going to, they're going to work with the city uh, to put a sign that uh, limits the uh, opportunity to make a left-hand turn to go west between certain hours, and I assume those are hours of peak travel, morning, probably morning. But they don't have any discussion about, uh, and that may or may not be adequate, I don't know. But they don't have any discussion about people wanting to make a left-hand southbound turn from Cerritos onto Chestnut. Um, and many people do that. They don't want to sit in the, in the queue at Cerritos and Los Alamitos Boulevard. They pass through the light and they get into the queue, which is now an unsignaled, uh, unsigned intersection and make a left there and, and proceed through the neighborhood and do what they're going to do. Uh, there's, no, there's no talk about how you're going to mitigate that, which is going to be very problematic. In addition, the fact that if you can't make a left uh, during certain hours 
from Chestnut on the Cerritos, that means you can't access the 605 northbound uh, on-ramp, which means you're gonna have to go all the way around the project down to Catella here. And I don't know if that was addressed in the traffic report, but my main concern is the Chestnut Cerritos intersection and, and more importantly, the move from westbound Cerritos to southbound Chestnut. A uh, couple points. The Olson traffic study studied three intersections. We've studied nine locations. I just gave you credit for that. Well, it, don't, don't give me credit for it. Give your city traffic engineer credit who directed the gentleman standing behind me or sitting next to me at RK Engineers. So they collaboratively came up with this traffic study. They studied everything in the traffic study according to CEQA guidelines and uh, everything is based on actual counts. While there are projections, that's generally accepted CEQA standards for how that's done. And Brian Estrada with RK Engineers is here and can, can answer the specific points that, that you laid out. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Hi, good evening, uh, commissioners. Brian Estrada, RK Engineering Group. We did the uh, traffic impact study. A um, couple comments were brought up. Um, the uh, assumptions that were done for future conditions, um, those are industry standard uh, methodology, and it's all started off of baseline existing traffic counts. So it's nothing that we're um, coming up with out of left field. It's you take the existing traffic counts and we add more traffic to it. So what happens when things get worse? Um, so that's a very conservative and um, realistic uh, ec uh, estimate based on existing conditions as they stand today and future planned development in the area. Um, Can I ask the, you, yeah? did you directly take into account the 50 units that are going next door? And then, I mean, yep. they're big units with lots of bedrooms and the 150 cars minimum that'll be coming out of there. Yes, we did. We took, in, we took that development into account, absolutely as well as uh, several others in the area, uh, not just in the city of Los Alamitos, Long Beach, Seal Beach, um, Hawaiian Gardens. We contacted all neighboring jurisdictions and got projections of development throughout the area on top of an overall blanketed growth of traffic. So we bump everything up as a baseline and then we add in specific projects. We really double count in a lot of ways growth. So you've got a a very conservative analysis of future conditions. Um, the uh, comment on um, the left turn, uh, so uh, going from westbound on Cerritos, making that left turn on Chestnut, that was analyzed. Um, the level of service and delay at, for that movement was calculated. Um, it was shown to operate adequately. Um, so no mitigation was required to restrict or modify that turn with the addition of the project. Um, how level of service is calculated at that intersection at, at Cerritos and Chestnut, uh, it's an unsignalized intersection. Cerritos is the major arterial, Chestnut the minor cross street. The level of service for that intersection is based on the worst movement, which would be that left turn going northbound on Chestnut making the left. So we look at that first and we say, okay, that's, that's what's controlling the level of service at this intersection. And that's where the mitigation came from of restricting left turns um, because we had a failing movement that was existing prior to this project going in, the project was projected to add some traffic to that movement. Um, so now we have an impact there. So the restriction of that movement um, was the mitigation as an alternative to uh, putting in a traffic signal or in a lot of cases, um, you've got a, um, a full closure of that uh, roadway with, a, with some kind of raised median um, that was looked at and determined to be a non-viable alternative because you do have businesses that utilize that two-way left turn lane as well. And so um, 
without totally d disrupting traffic patterns within the area, the uh, peak hour restriction was uh, the preferred methodology there. Uh, um, we also looked at Cerritos and Los Alamitos, looked at it under existing conditions, future conditions, and um, based on the traffic counts and the uh, future growth, we did show that intersection to operate acceptably based on Los Alamitos standards, and no uh, impacts or mitigations were required. And that was also with the um, uh, Los Alamitos modification that has been recently done. We went back and did a follow-up analysis once those improvements were made, and um, we still have an acceptable level of service based on Los Alamitos criteria, which is consistent with uh, County of uh, Orange Congestion Management Plan. Okay. Yep. A um, couple things. You, I think you stated. I, I don't know if you mis misspoke. Well, you, you said that the most impact at the Cerritos Chestnut intersection was from Chestnut going north. I would submit to you there's way more vehicles traveling on Cerritos than Chestnut. But, Way more, so I would I believe that the that the that the most impact is going to be on travel on Cerritos. Um, so so let me let me also say something that at um, okay existing um, 2018 existing project traffic conditions. I'll focus on Chestnut Cerritos. It is graded an F which fails, we, we want a D. And then with your mitigation efforts, and again, let's repeat myself, but you stated in here that a light would not be acceptable because of the proximity to Los Alamitos and Cerritos. Um, in your mitigation is the sign requiring a right turn early between seven and nine, I think. But then an opening year, 2020, which I guess the project opening year, uh, you still grade that intersection as an F. So you haven't mitigated any impacts there. And, and, and again, when you talk about an intersection, it seems to me that you should consider all, all directions of travel through the intersection. That intersection happens to be like a T. It's not a cross street. But you should, it seems like you should, you should mitigate southbound, eastbound, northbound, whatever. <coughs> it doesn't look like there's any discussion of I mean, you told us you considered a, a median strip, but there's no discussion of any mitigation efforts to address the southbound turn on the chestnut. And, and I, I just think that it, you graded an F now and you graded an F in 2020. Mm -hmm. um, your first point, um, you're absolutely correct. The uh, westbound left turn from Cerritos onto Chestnut is the heavier flow of traffic. It's got, based on our traffic counts, what page uh, you over 100. What, uh, page, what page are you looking at? I'm looking at the tra our traffic study. I'm not oh. sure which document. If you have the, uh, the mitigated negative deck up there, I don't have that. OK. Uh, I'll um, work from this. This, was, this is from our traffic study. This is Exhibit 3-2, existing traffic volumes. We show over 100 cars making that left turn from Cerritos onto Chestnut in a peak hour, 109 in the morning, 107 in the a uh, afternoon. Is that westbound? Westbound turning left, okay. yep. And we show that there's only 43 vehicles making a northbound left from Chestnut onto Cerritos. So clearly you're right, that is a higher movement. However, um, the <coughs> pure presence of more traffic doesn't translate specifically into an impact or a more significant impact. It's based on the uh, level of delay, vehicle delay that a car um, experiences making that left turn. So uh, the westbound uh, movement only needs to yield to oncoming traffic from the east, uh, whereas the northbound left turn movement needs a gap from both directions. It's, uh, it requires, um, it's a much more difficult movement to make, making that movement from the minor street onto the, uh, the cross street. You're also um, required to come to a complete stop there's more delay involved in that. And so that is what translates into the um, uh, level of service of F. The level of service for that westbound left turn is analyzed and reviewed, um, but it was not failing. 
But to me, if you have an F in 2018 and your project's going to be done at 2020 and you still graded it as an F, you haven't mitigated it. No, okay. So, yeah. You probably so, can't get a G. <laughs> I, maybe I'm missing something. No, so you're, we show in our tables, we show unmitigated and mitigated scenarios for existing conditions and we show unmitigated and mitigated scenarios for future conditions. So um, part of SQL requirements is to look at direct impacts which are typically existing plus project only, just looking at the project itself, and also the cumulative impact, future conditions with growth and other developments, um, what that impact is. And we do it both ways. We say, okay, what's the impact uh, under existing with no mitigation, and what is it with mitigation? And then in future conditions, what is it with no mitigation, and what is it with mitigation? So it's done both ways for both existing and future conditions. So the mitigation is still there in the future. It, Mr. Chairman, if I just mention it's table 19 on page 122 is what's being referred to. And you can see under the chestnut Cerritos uh, point there uh, within the table, there's an unmitigated and then a mitigated line. The unmitigated still shows that, that lengthy delay, that 72.4 second delay unmitigated which would give you a level of service F and that level of service F in that delay is based on that northbound to westbound left turn movement but then if you, if you notice below that it drops down with mitigation to 25.5 seconds yes but that does not that that addresses they mitigate the and I may be wrong in this but the way I look they mitigate the impact on northbound to westbound right but they don't mitigate the, the other movements. westbound to southbound. What uh, happens correct. there is the um, the delay that's reported on the unmitigated uh, uh, condition is the northbound left turn delay. When that movement is restricted, we then report right. the next highest movement delay, which would be, I believe in this case, it's actually the southbound left turn, still higher than uh, uh, that westbound left um, coming out of the the business park there is traffic coming out of there on that north leg so that's so what you see there is 72.4 that's northbound left delay when we restrict that now we move to the next highest delay at that intersection next highest movement inferring that that westbound left is still lower than level of service D if it was higher, if that westbound left became higher than level of service D, that's where we would have a re, a report, uh, an impact, and then we'd have to look at some potential mitigation for it. We didn't see that on this report. If I could add to that too, well, first two things: one, our traffic engineer for the city is in the audience. If you'd like to, if you have any questions of him. Second, if at that intersection there's there's a, a marking on the street for the eastbound movement that says keep clear. Mm -hmm. So that when you have that strong uh, push, the, the, the PM peak hour push of everybody leaving Long Beach and hopefully coming to our community or, or stopping our community and buying lots of things on their way home, um, you, you've got uh, an area that's required to have a gap open so that, that then um, westbound movement to southbound at that intersection should be clear if there is that, that heavy period of flow for them to be able to make that move, assuming everybody keeps the intersection clear if they're supposed to. But I think that's why you're seeing uh, this really not being an issue uh, with the additional trips being added because of, of the ability for those gaps to occur during those peak hour movements. You, and as was pointed out, you just don't, there's no way to do that for the northbound uh, to westbound movement. They're gonna be now be forced to have to head further east to the signalized intersection uh, and then uh, go north to the next signalized intersection to make that turn, or the other option is they come up to this intersection, make a right turn, and then make a U-turn at you know at the uh, Low South Cerritos intersection, which you which you can do. And that was uh, analyzed as well the redistribution of traffic as a result of closing down that left turn. Part of that mitigated scenario looked at the impact to the uh, other intersections within the network as how traffic may. Um, shift as a result of that closure. So that was reviewed. Okay. 
Go. It just seems like they're not driving the same no, intersection. That's not going to work. I'm just glad my daughter graduated the high school and I don't have to go anywhere near there anymore. Right. Yeah. All right. There. <laughs> Thank you. The westbound on Cerritos, we're not going to be able to turn and go south into their complex, so correct? Where we turn on to Chestnut, they're not going to be turning into the complex to the apartment. No, they have to um, go around. Yeah, I, I don't. That's uh, that's a two-way left turn median that is a legal maneuver to make. Yeah, they can do I'm that. I'm sorry, it's what? That movement, movement. from Ch uh, from Cerritos into the into the complex is a full access driveway. They have a two-way left turn median there to make that move. Yeah. Okay, uh, somebody like to make a motion on the, if there's no other questions regarding this. Uh, uh, a motion uh, to adopt. Uh, Which one? It's the first one. The first one uh, dealing with the. Uh, motion to adopt 18 27. I'll second. Okay. Is, would that be with. Uh, Which one the, is that? Sorry. The, what page uh, is here. that on? Well, I'm looking at the. Oh, okay. Excuse me, Chair. With, with the uh, addition of the recordation? Before we move, uh, are we still operating under the bifurcation? Yes, yes, we're going to vote on this, okay. and then, then we'll uh, move to the project. So, uh, and, and just to clarify, we will agree to whatever conditions the Water Board puts on us and full disclosure and transparency to our future residents just all so right. everybody's clear on that all right great so are we really just doing number just four is just number four okay. right here yeah and then uh and uh we discussed the recordation of the uh tenant notice uh, uh upon the uh acceptance of the uh and, and after the appeal period for the uh this approval with those corrections yes all right. Uh, do we need a roll call on this vote yes, for a resolution? Yes. Yeah, for this resolution. Okay. So uh, we have the motion. We have a second to, uh, to adopt resolution number eighteen twenty seven uh, with the uh, recordation recordation requirement the item for four, uh, right? for item number four. Well, condition number four under mitigation measures. No, but here here we're is only number four. Only that number four Not, on this yes. resolution. Okay. So can we have a roll call vote, please? Chair DeBull? Uh, I'm going to vote no, and I'm voting no because, and like it noted for the record, my reason for no is that I, I believe that we should uh, wait until the site has been, they have the closure letter from the, uh, the uh, water board uh, on the uh, monitoring wells. So my vote is no. Vice Chair Riley, absent. Commin Commissioner Andrade, absent. Commissioner Quilty? Yes. Commissioner Gross? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner Sofalcanic? Can I comment before I vote? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. I was, uh, after reading this, I was definitely going to vote no uh, because of my concerns. The traffic concerns, I still don't think they've been mitigated, but we'll see. Uh, I had concerns about the contamination also. Um, I, like Commissioner DeBolt, do not understand why we couldn't remediate the site before we proceeded with construction. But I understand now about the funding, and I'm, I have a, com a degree of comfort with the fact that construction will not begin, as I understand it, by the qualification of the motion until we receive a letter from the Water Quality Control Board that all contaminants have been adequately removed. And because of that assurance, I'm going to vote yes. Okay. The motion passes. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, before we move on, we're going to take a five minute break. Thank you. Okay, and uh, we'll reconvene here at about five minutes and we'll go on to the uh, balance of the uh, item. Okay, if everybody will uh, take your seats, we'll move on to the project itself. I just bring this. Yeah. Okay. Um, we since we've had the applicant make his presentation, I think at this point what I'll do is I'll open it to the public for uh, any uh, public comment. Anybody wishing to speak to the 
project, ex the apartment uh, project uh, itself. Uh, this is the time, so if you'd like to come on up. Jane, Lasser. Oh, hi folks, Guy Whitney here. Uh, a couple things quick, and this will be very brief. Um, I am for the project, full disclosure. I, th I think it's going to be great for the residents. I think it's going to be good for the businesses locally. It's a great walkable place, restaurants and shops. Good for the city. It's a gateway into Los Al. And, and also, the other thing that makes me think that it's a positive thing is it's a really good balance for rentals. There's a lot of, there's rentals in the city. Um, not like this, though. Everything's built 50 plus years ago. I'm not aware of any current rental available right now in the city that's not 50 plus years old. This just be a good addition for some a beautiful new place that even looks better than uh, the business that preceded it. Uh, very quick on environmental, just this will be super brief, but I, with all things considered and the stuff I've heard today, and in 2018, the levels of safeguards for human safety, uh, testing professionals and experts, I can't not understand at all the lack of trust and lack of confidence in what's already in place to protect all of us. And I appreciate the time. Thank you. Gene, come on. Thank you for your patience. I'm not quite as mobile as I used to be. <laughs> My name is Gene Lassers. I've hopefully don't knock this off here. Um, I've been associated with Los Alamitos for maybe 40, 50 years. And I own a property at 10622 Walnut, the corner of Sausalito and Walnut. So what the projects that are going on there, of course, impact my project there. I tried to think of this as an analogy. Uh, first of all, I think it's a worthy project that's going on. But let's look at it in relationship to something totally removed from Los Alamitos, and that's the Burj Khalif, the tallest building in the world in the Persian Gulf. It's 167 stories tall. And as I mentioned, it is the tallest building in the world. Now think, if, the, if this building was approved to go at the corner of Los Alamitos and Cerritos, that the zoning and all criteria allowed that building to go there, well, that would be not practical and it would not be appropriate. So I think what we have here is a project that is way too big for the property. The project density, as I mentioned, is beyond conception. The traffic has already been addressed. If you go to Chestnut when Los Alamitos High opens in the day or ends, when Oak Street, the traffic streams around on Sausalito, it's a major, major problem. The infrastructure around the project is not conducive to the project itself. The streets here were built maybe 70 years ago, and the housing around here uh, is not adaptable to a project that's this size. The uh, surrounding commercial is not uh, conducive to accommodating uh, this type of project. And last of all, uh, if you haven't been down there at all, um, as mentioned, take your child to La Salle High School in the morning, you cannot get through there. Everybody's zipping down Chestnut to get around the traffic. So I don't see how the traffic is going to be mitigated going east or west. I'll leave you with one thought. All people in their home, which is their castle, are entitled to quiet enjoyment habitality a legal term. So when you're considering this, once you start this, once it's there, it's not going anywhere. So I ask you to be judicious, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Hello, commissioners. I'm Jim Montemer. I've been associated with Los Alamitos 
in many ways over the last almost 40 years. And I look at this project as one where I raised four children here. Yes, I fought the traffic in Los Al. I was very happy when they got their own, their own cars or get there. Other than the fact they don't have a parking lot for them. They have to park everywhere else. But that's just part of living here. But the beauty of Los Al is it's, cl it's close. You know everybody. I coached around here after about, you know, going through four kids, you know about one-third to two-thirds of the kids, it seems. Now they're moving back in, getting married. I've got a lot of young kids coming that graduated back in old, the, old, uh, the old three class that just came to my house and brought all their children over. They all would like to have rented here in La Salle. They're in Long Beach. They're in, near Seal Beach. Huntington, of course, has tons of it. I, I know that area quite, quite well. I think we need an area that's, that's upscale in a sense that they can move their families here and get in that community. Uh, that's one of the things that happened. I know three people from, from Los Al just moved in Ovation down the street. You're familiar with that one that they just built the 55 plus. It's, it's interesting that, that, that both these properties are unique. They seem to be very similar other than the fact that one's 55 and only. I walked through there to look at it, looked at the pictures that, that Hutton put up, and they're similar. And they're the kind of things that that millennial generation looks for. It's interesting, so I asked them, are you gonna buy houses? They said, no, we're gonna rent, because you don't buy houses, you, you, you invest in other things you, you buy later. I didn't grow up, I, I'll be, I'm 68, I didn't grow up that way. You buy a house as soon as you can, and you know, try to be with it, but it's a different generation, and I think this particular unit would fit them well. Plus, Los Al has spent a fortune redoing Los Al Boulevard, bringing business in, you've got nice restaurants that people go to, that you can walk to from, this, from here. That's one of the things that's nice if you can have, I know Los Al is trying to get to a walking community, and this sort of plays into that. Yes, I know there's the older rentals, the older properties on Chestnut, Walnut in there, but that's unfortunate uh, that, that communities change and Los Al has changed. Remember the entrance on the other side of the boulevard when it was, that rock, it was a Mason area and rock place? looked terrible. And then they tore it down, they built that, that complex there, so Long Beach looked really good, then unfortunately it hit the Collins property, and uh, looked at that, that had been there for a long time, and it was industrial. And it just had a different look. I had friends come to Los Angeles say, when they came in off the 605, that was the first thing they saw was, that was the entrance to the city. So I think this does change it. It does change a lot of things in the city. And I think it's a positive move. And I hope the commissioners will look at that and say it's to change the Los Al. So it goes along with your nice barriers down the middle of Los Al Boulevard. A lot of people complained when they were put in because you couldn't make left and right turns to the same places. But guess what? We all got used to it. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to come up? Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Bill Phillips. I'm a resident of Los Alamitos. I've been here since 1998. I've seen the city go through a lot of changes. I own a business here in town. Um, and speaking from a retail perspective, um, anytime there's more bodies coming to town, more people living in town, that has a pretty significant impact on, on the retail business overall. Uh, we all struggle in retail here. Um, we compete with a lot of different things online and so on, but we all have uh, a, a inherent interest, interest in, in building the community and doing good for the community. And I think what is going on here is gonna bring a lot more families to the, business, uh, to the community. It's gonna help the business. It's gonna attract more people. And I think the, the big impact it's gonna have is obviously um, on the tax base. And it's gonna have a significant impact on that and uh, provide a lot more uh, revenue for the city. So we're in favor of it. Uh, and uh, other business owners I've, spoke, I've spoken to all feel the same way. We think it's a good thing for the city. Uh, they've crossed their T's and dotted their I's. We're impressed with the plans and uh, we're eager and excited for this to happen. Thank you very much. Great. Anyone else? Go ahead, come up. Hi, my name is Tracy Mackey, and I live on Chestnut Street uh, on the corner of Sausalito and Chestnut. And I was born and raised here, so I'm 56 years old. I'm very familiar with the Collins property from previous years. I am in complete favor of this complex. Um, I do see that, that you guys are concerned with the traffic, but to my knowledge, does the entrance to this complex come off of Cerritos? Yes, ma'am. Yes. And then the exit is on to Sausalito? Yes, ma'am. 
Yeah, okay. So, Sosley, you're going to have options. You're going to go either to the right, which is going to take you to the 605 north or south, or if you go to the left and merge onto Chestnut Street, you can only take 605 north. So, I know I'm not here to discuss traffic, but to my knowledge, it's not going to impact our neighborhood as much. And I live one block away from there. So, I think. Let me just read. I'm not a really good speaker, so excuse me. So I wrote, my name is Tracy Mackey. I currently live on Chestnut Street, one block from the empty lot. That is in the process of being approved for building. I'm here to support this project. I'm very happy with the plans that the Collins family has presented. I feel that this will be an, an asset to our city. It will provide an advantage to many of us that are property owners on Chestnut, Walden, and Oak, and closer and uh, and more than likely will raise our property value which is in favor for people that own properties there um, I also am very pleased to have this huge lot of dirt filled with a beautiful complex like this instead of dirt and dust car washes and just breathing yucky stuff um, let's see I don't agree with industrial buildings because that causes even more traffic and it's not as beautiful. Um, I've lived on Chestnut Street all my life, 56 years. Um, I've watched the Collins family, his, Monty Collins' parents, run a terrific business. My mother dealt with Mr. and Mrs. Collins for many years at Brigman Disposal. They are a top class family. They do what they can. They are completely perfectionist. I have nothing but confidence in their plans that they have presented to you. And I hope that you guys will consider this. This is a wonderful, wonderful place for people to enter the city of Los Alamitos. Will it impact that traffic right there? It might slightly, but the entrance is right off of Cerritos. So it doesn't impact Chestnut Street, and Oak Street, and Walnut. The exit, they're going to go either right and left. The school, that's what impacts our traffic on Chestnut Street. So we have a lot of out-of-district students that come into our district, and which is really a compliment, but it really causes a lot of traffic. So with this building, 107 apartments, you think there's going to be a lot of families in there that will be able to send their children to our school district. So maybe that might help with the congestion that's coming off the freeways from people that are out of district bringing their kids into our district? I don't know. But I think it will have a strong impact. Um, I just wanted to also express that I've noticed over the years the consistency of the Collins family and how they've shown since the early 70s before that was uh, made into a full, it used to be a dead end right there on Chestnut Street. Um, they've always kept their business, uh, they used to have a heavy equipment of business there. It was organized, it was clean, it was very respectable to our neighborhood. And I'm within a block. Um, I've watched this piece of property since I was a very young girl. They have always shown respect to us as their neighbors, as in whatever they can do to accommodate us to make our living conditions better. Um, I think they are a very classy family. And I don't know, they have business partners and all, but I have no doubt, is this mine? I have no doubt in my mind that this is going to be an asset to the city of Los Alamitos. It is beautiful. It is, it is, it's, it's gated. It's, it's, you know, it, it's a lovely place compared to what we have now on that corner. Um, <clears throat> I just, I also had written down that I cannot express how much, I cannot express enough as to how much I look forward to having a beautiful complex that is in an entrance to my neighborhood and to Los Alamitos as a city. I'm very content with the fact that this family will continue to to provide our family with another classy, well-run, well-maintained environment. I must also mention that this will affect our school district. 
it will bring families that will live in Los Alamitos that could attend our awesome school districts instead of from all these other cities. That's the problem I see. My street does get affected by, t by traffic, but there's no avoidance of that. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, because the entrance is on Cerritos, they're not going to enter off a street. They're not going to enter off our neighborhood to get into there. They're going to enter off of Cerritos and exit onto Sausalito, which will be a right or a left to get to the freeways. The kids going to school there, out of those 107 apartments, there's going to be a lot of kids going to Los Amigos High School, going to the other schools. That's a huge, huge, huge asset for us because that'll cut down on a lot of traffic, I feel, coming from out of the city. So I hope that you all do approve this. I think it's a great idea. I look forward to it, and I think it's gonna be beautiful, and I'd re much rather see that than a bunch of dirt. So thank you for listening. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hey, <laughs> anyone else? Okay. I think I'll make this really quick. Uh, good evening. My name is Vince Leone. I've been a part of this community for over 30 years, owning commercial buildings, uh, apartment buildings. Um, this project, um, as far as I feel, uh, is the new beginning of Los Alamitos. This development struck close to me when I recently have a 62-year-old brother that is a veteran and just had his foot amputated. The reason I bring this up is there's not a whole lot of buildings in the city of Los Alamitos that are ADA compliant and have elevators for residents like him. Um, also, the, uh, the whole construction and the architectural um, aspect is just first class. And um, this is something that I would definitely support. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, come on up. My name is Javier Aguayo. I own a heating and air conditioning company. I had four kids come to Los Alamitos High School, already graduate, and one on the way. Uh, she's at McAuliffe. Uh, I'm in favor of this because uh, I've been around as far as, you know, 30 years doing construction. We've done, I've done mansions from the Wrigley Mansions to uh, Bel Air. I've been many places, but uh, as far as quality, it's good. Uh, that's what I usually do is quality apartments, condos, homes. And so, um, yeah, I'm in favor of this as far as for quality for the, for the neighborhood. I just recently moved into Rossmore. And so, um, you know, I'm all for this. As far as the traffic for the kids, it's always traffic. You work your way around it. You know, you come in through Bloomfield, you come in through <coughs> Cypress, whatever. But anyway, um, and I'm um, also doing a couple of complex or projects here on Los Alamitos Boulevard, right next to the fish company. We're doing all that strip. So, anyway, so that's in my favor of all. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. I'll go ahead and uh, close the uh, public hearing. I'll bring it back to the <coughs> commission. Um, any further discussion? Go ahead, Wendy. I do have a question for the applicant. Go ahead. Maybe I missed it. Do you have security cameras that you're going to have in there? Absolutely. Okay. There's extensive security cameras throughout the community. Every entrance and exit, <coughs> pedestrian and vehicular, is videoed so we know who comes in, when they come in. Uh, to expand on your question about security, we also have FOBs. It's a digital FOB. So if the five planning commissioners live there, we would know which planning commissioner entered what gate at what time. It's a great security tool in the event there ever is a problem down the road. <coughs> okay, and this is really more just a discussion here is on the parking for the street. Um, my thinking is what we did on the Project West of not if we could also consider not allowing parking permits, permits. No permits yeah. yeah and onto the street partially not just because I think you guys did a great job of putting parking in there and that's where we want them to park but part of the other reason being is an apartment too 
that could be a fluctuation of people where parking passes may end up becoming just transferred out to other people that shouldn't be given that aren't really residents in our town we don't have a that. problem with that whatsoever our residents by nature have newer vehicles they want their vehicles covered they want them behind the gate it's not an issue from our standpoint that is fine mm -hmm. any other comments so I'll make a motion I'll make a motion to approve 18-28 with the condition of no parking permits allowed on the street as we did for the other project. I'll second. Okay. I see a puzzled look on the... Well, well um, Mr. Chairman, we didn't really get the chance to do the staff presentation. I know oh, I'm sorry. And there's, and there's a motion on the table, so I don't want to change that. I just wanted to point out that we did identify within the report some uh, some design related concerns i don't know if the, the commission no. wanted to discuss those items uh if they agreed with staff we have talked with the applicant about that um they may want to address that as well but I, but you have a motion we have table. well we can we can have we, a, we can have a discussion before we vote and if we want to modify it we can do you have any uh, elevation slides that you can show us uh to illustrate your concerns Those kind of elevations? Is that what you're asking for? Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, I've got a few. Yeah, let me just a handful. The rest are in your packet. I see what I see. What Les is talking about, uh, and you can in your staff concerns, uh, you outlined a few things. But I think uh, the gentleman talked about some of these. You talk about the use of wood, ornate and painted tile, and. Uh, additional ornamental iron elements. I think you said that that was going to be incorporated. You suggested that they were going to use some higher end material. Is that, is that what your concerns were? Uh, yes, uh, just a, a variety of items. One was uh, uh, the articulation of the building, um, maybe being able to enhance a little bit more greater depth uh, than what's represented right now. A lot of the relief is maybe six to 12 inches. If that could be maybe stretched more, so it's a little more uh, you know, again, articulation, especially along the street frontage. Uh, I did talk with the applicant about, you know, uh, maybe a stronger, we, or he mentioned maybe, you know, with coloring and stronger contrast and, and the shading will also help, uh, you know, pop and the, with the elevations. Another item was with regards to pedestrian connectivity. As was mentioned by several people today, uh, the walkability of the environment there, and there are, uh, uh, at least three doors uh, uh, within um, two of the buildings, and what could be done to maybe enhance and embellish those. Right now, they're really more like emergency exits at the stairwells, and they just are a pad or a landing on the outside as, as a minimum requirement. But uh, the discussion was what could be done to really make that more like a, a pedestrian entrance into the buildings with a pathway that either leads out to the street with a gated uh, access point or the, or the pathway that would lead to the gates that are existing adjacent to the drive the drive uh, gates for the project but just a stronger sense of again that pedestrian connectivity sense of arrival uh, in those locations um, uh, again one would be on Cerritos and then two on the Sausalito uh, frontage so again uh, we, we did talk about this the applicant may want to respond to that but uh, I think in general there was at least in our conversation there was an agreement to that um, and we just think there, there's some value in being able to see some of those enhancements, those embellishments, uh, and, and attention on the pedestrian connections. Uh, that would be a real help for the, the future residents. If you, I'll go ahead and go A ahead. few quick points. Go ahead. Um, I met with Mr. Johnson and Mr. Oliver last week. We met for an hour plus, and we spoke about what Mr. Johnson just described in the last 30 seconds or so. There's complete agreement from our side. Um, I think it's important to realize you are looking at computer generated imagery, which sort of looks slightly robotic and the, the real building will look better. There's also some color differences between the overhead and the TV monitor that I can see. And I think the TV monitor on your side shows that too. We are very comfortable that we're on the same page with Mr. Johnson and Mr. Oliver. We're very comfortable working through these issues with staff. I, I think what was in the staff report 
was essentially what we discussed. I wouldn't change a word of it. So to improve the elevation with different colors, pop outs, wrought iron, stones, woods in select locations, we're very comfortable doing. If you want to make that a condition, we're happy to make that a condition and we'll work through those issues with staff on a go forward basis. I'm confident we can get there very easily. And I think you are as well. So I'm modify your motion um, or can we modify to add that as also a another component of the approval that we have you work with the staff to do some other modifications on the building if you like we we have some draft language if you okay. uh, maybe as a condition for right, consideration ahead. i'll just read that to you right. uh, to the reasonable satisfaction of the director the applicant shall modify the project to address aesthetic concerns noted in the staff report to improve the project street frontage in curb appeal, the interior pedestrian circulation and pedestrian connectivi uh, connectivity slash access from the street. And no parking permits on for the residents. Fine. Okay, so <laughs> with, with, that, with that change, we'll go ahead and uh, have a roll call vote. Chair DeBolt. Uh, aye. Vice Chair Riley, absent. Commissioner Android, absent. Commissioner Quilty. Yes. Commissioner Gross? Yes. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner Sofocanic? Yes. Great. Okay. Motion passes. 5 0. Thank and you, everyone, for your time this evening. Okay. You bet. Please call if you have any questions or concerns at any point in the future. Right. Doors open. Okay. Okay. We'll move on to, I guess, items from the Community Development Director. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commission members, uh, just a couple of items. One, as a reminder, uh, next Tuesday evening is the Commissioner's uh, dinner. Hopefully you're all able to attend uh, that event. It'll be my first time, but I heard it's a lot of fun. I'm, hopefully that's the case <laughs> from your past experiences with that, but uh, we hope that you're all able to attend. Uh, and again, as another reminder, uh, we do not have a meeting during the month of December. Right. And uh, if you're not able to attend the meeting, uh, uh, myself and the staff want to wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Those of you that will be there Tuesday, we hope to do that in person with you. So, and don't bit. forget the development director buys us all drinks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I would be glad to. <laughs> 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 right. First, first, right. drink, first drink is on me. Absolutely. Right. absolutely. Okay. Any items nope. from the uh, commission? Any commission members? <laughs> a reminder, Winter Wonderland is this um, Saturday. Yes. I know who is Santa Claus and Mrs. Claus. <laughs> so come all out and see us. <laughs> Let's see. Grateful Hearts has a thing Friday night, The Great Gatsby. And as you know, Blair is quite a help to our community, Bear Platerini. Um, what else is going on? Oh. Sunday, Precious Life Shelter from 3.30 to 6.30. We do a pre what we call a Precious Christmas. We have an open house so that we can take tours through and explain how we work there and what the girls go through in order to advance in each step of the program and that our goals are basically is to get them off of all state funds and become independent people. Great. So you're all welcome to come out. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, with that, we'll adjourn.